Hello everybody and welcome back to the channel and welcome back to Sniper Elite 4. Today I'll be continuing my rifles in real life video and we'll be talking about the secondary weapons of the game and the real life stories behind them. So without further ado, I have a cold and that's why my voice sounds so horrible. Uh, but I needed to get this video out and unintelligently I didn't record this script when I finished it, which was quite a while ago. Instead, I'm recording it on the day it came out, or will come out, even. So, without further ado, let's get into this. <clears throat> the M1A1 Thompson originates from a submachine gun... My phone just went off. The M1A1 Thompson originates from a submachine gun developed by John Thompson, known as the Annihilator. The weapon was designed during the twilight hours of World War I as a competitor to the German MP18, but never saw action due to the end of- SHUT UP! Anyway, it was a competitor to the German MP18, but never saw action due to the end of the war. Thompson would not be bankrupted by world peace, however. He refined the weapon and got rid of the rather uncouth name, and the end product of these toils was the Thompson M1921. The weapon was popular with the police force who bought them because they provided a high amount of firepower in a small, easy to use package, but the more prominent users of the Thompson were the gangsters of Roaring Twenties America, who cut down the stocks and barrels and fitted them with absurd 100 round drums, which were, this being America, available from Thompson directly. The weapon was designated the M1928A1 upon achieving orders from the US Navy and USMC, as well as by the British and French. The Thompson M1A1, as seen in game, was a simplified version of the previous weapons, featuring a conventional blowback mechanism instead of the costly blish lock. It also did away with gigantic drum magazines and was just sold with more practical and more reliable box magazines with a 20 or 30 round capacity. The world famous MP40 was developed from the substantially less famous yet still incredibly successful MP38. The MP38 was developed by Irma before the start of the war as the replacement to the earlier EMP and it was an incredibly innovative weapon. It had a folding stock which could be used when folded in to make the gun more suitable for storage or carry, and used when folded out to make the gun substantially more ugly. The weapon used plastic furniture instead of the more conventional wood which was incredibly innovative at the time. The MP38 was also very controllable and accurate. The MP40 was externally similar to the MP38, but featured a greater quantity of pressed steel parts, this made the MP40 much easier to make, and it was used in great numbers by the German army during World War II. The Beretta Model 1918 was a precursor to the Mab 38, and was effectively an OVP in a different set of clothes. To be fair to Beretta, no other submachine gun designs existed at the time, so making a direct copy of the OVP was a novel concept. The weapon provided the basis for the Beretta Model 1938, also known as the Mab 38. The Mab was a large submachine gun developed from the Beretta Model 1830, which as far as I know is a semi-automatic carbine based on the M1918 SMG we just talked about, although I couldn't find any proof of this, so it may be incorrect. Either way, the Mab was here, and it made several innovations on the previous SMG, such as a magazine that was inserted into the gun from the bottom instead from above, and a double trigger arrangement where one trigger would fire in semi-automatic, with the other being fully automatic, although this was a feature on some M1918s, so calling it innovation would not be strictly true. The Mab was also made available with spacious 40 round magazines, and was issued to Italian and German forces, the Mab evolved into the model 1938-42, which featured a shorter barrel and less wood furniture, and a dust cover on the bolt handle to reduce malfunctions from the ingress of dirt. The weapon was succeeded by the M1938-44, 
which was a drastically simplified version of the weapon designed for ease of construction towards the end of the war. It was issued to German forces because Italy has switched sides by then as usual and it was designated the MP739. The FNAB model 1943 was another Italian submachine gun and was developed by Fabrica Nazionale di Army. Unlike most wartime SMGs, the weapon was incredibly well made and reliable. Only about 7,000 were made, most of which were issued to German and RSI troops fighting in Italy. The weapon was available with 20 or 40 round magazines and incorporated a muzzle brake in the barrel, similar to that on the PPSH-41. The M3 submachine gun was chiefly designed by George Hyde, who was commissioned to make a cheap submachine gun to supplement the very effective yet incredibly expensive Thompson submachine guns. Inspired by the values behind the Sten, and incredibly uninspired by everything else about it, Hyde designed the M3, which quickly became known as the Grease Gun, due to its resemblance to, well, a Grease Gun. The weapon's incredibly low rate of fire should have made it controllable, but the 45 ACP cartridge still provided decent recoil. It was unreliable with a dodgy bolt handling magazine which was prone to jamming. The weapon was replaced by the M3A1, which featured a redesigned bolt and transparent plastic dust cover, which was added to the magazine to reduce stoppages. A silencer could be fitted, and by the end of the war, the M3A1 completely replaced the Thompson to become the standard US submachine gun, and it remained in service throughout the Korean War, Nam, and into the First Gulf War. As a side note, the designations used by the US Army were proper rubbish. The M1 designation was applied to the M1 Garand, M1 Thompson, M1 Carbine, M1 Bazooka, and M1 Flamethrower. The M3 designation could also apply to the Grease Gun and M3 Carbine. I know you're unlikely to get to a situation where there is confusion between the Thompson and the Garand when you say, pass me the M1, but it's still an issue anyway. Rant over, back to the video. The Sten submachine gun was a submachine gun designed by Reginald Shepard and Harold Turpin and produced in Enfield, like everything else we've ever made. The Sten Mark I was originally designed after the British poo-pooed the idea of the submachine gun as they were so-called gangster weapons and thoroughly unsporting. However, World War II was not sporting and after a close shave at Dunkirk in 1940, the need for a submachine gun was realised. The Sten Mark I was simple and featured a wire stock and no pistol grip but did include such luxuries as a muzzle brake and a folding vertical grip. These were promptly thrown out when designing the even more Spartan Sten Mark II, which is the one seen in game. The Mark II was heavily simplified but featured some improvements in design and safety features, and also a magazine housing that could be rotated around the gun to act as a dust cover for the ejection port when it wasn't in use. The Sten Mark II S was a silenced version with integrated silencer. Whilst it could be fired in fully automatic, this was extremely damaging to the silencer so it was almost exclusively used in single shot mode. The Sten Mark III came afterwards as a development of the Sten Mark I created by different people and production ran alongside the Sten Mark II. The Mark V was introduced in 1944 and featured a wooden pistol grip and wooden fixed stock. The Silent Sten Mark VI was effectively a Mark V fitted with a modified version of the Mark II's integral silencer. A vertically fed Sten was actually built in small numbers by the Germans towards the end of the war as a cheaper alternative to the MP40 and designated the MP3008 and also known as the Volksmaschinen pistol which translates to the People's Submachine Gun. The PPSH-41 has its roots in the PPD-1934 submachine gun, a Russian effort inspired by the MP-28 and Suomi P-31. The weapon was effective with a 71 round drum magazine and a high standard of manufacture, but it proved costly to produce in large numbers. A revised version, the PPD-1940, was made to ease the cost of production but it was still too complex and finely engineered to be built in large numbers. Weapons designer Georgi Spargin 
stepped in, I've pronounced that wrong, and created the PPSH-41. The PPSH was made entirely from stamped parts and it had a formidable rate of fire and was available with a curved 35 round box magazine or 71 round drums, with the box magazine being favoured by troops due to the ease of carry and greater reliability compared to the drum magazines. The magazine ports on the PPSH were notoriously unreliable, with different individual magazines only truly working on different individual PPSHs. The weapon featured a muzzle brake integrated into the barrel to reduce recoil. It was later succeeded by the even more basic PPS-43, which was similar to the PPSH but with folding stock, no compatibility with drum magazines and no select fire. The OVP has its roots in an unusual weapon named the Twin Villa Parosa. By definition, this weapon is the first submachine gun ever made. However, as you can see, this is a bit of a stretch. If you classify a submachine gun as an automatic weapon firing a pistol caliber cartridge, the Twin Villa Parosa and its automatic fire and 9mm Glycenti ammunition fits the bill. However, the weapon has twin barrel, twin top fed magazines, a bipod or tripod, depending on your choice, machine gun style grips and was used by the Italian army who failed to see the potential of a light automatic weapon as a mounted machine gun. The weapon was produced between 1915 and 1917 and could take a front mounted shield to protect the user from oncoming fire. After World War I, having seen the success of the MP18, the Italians created the OVP. Fed from a top-mounted 25-round magazine and chambered like the Twin Villa Parosa before it in 9mm Glycenti, and it was mechanically similar to the gun that preceded it. The weapon features two triggers, one for automatic fire and the other for semi-automatic, a feature that was promptly nicked by Beretta when they were developing the MAB. As a side note, you may not have heard of 9mm Glycenti before, which is because it was a rubbish design. Its dimensions were identical to the 9x19mm Luger cartridge, which is now known as 9x19mm Parabellum and it's the NATO standard pistol cartridge. However, the Italian cartridge featured substantially less powder in the cartridge, which made it much weaker. Luger rounds will chamber in Glacenti mechanisms and vice versa due to their identical dimensions, but both will malfunction if fired in the other mechanism due to the different powder charges and this can be incredibly dangerous to the user. The MKB-42H was a prototype assault rifle and one could say it was the first assault rifle ever made, although the FG-42 could claim that, as the MKB was only ever produced as a prototype and wasn't issued to troops. The MKB was the product of downsizing the full-size 7.92 by 57mm cartridge used in the Car 98 k to make the smaller 7.92 by 33mm cartridge. Both Wolfer and Hanel were contracted to build automatic carbines for this cartridge. Hanel's design was deemed superior and it went into production. The project was kept away from Hitler, who believed that the MKB-42 was useless for combat and the higher calibre Car 98K was superior, and only personal intervention by troops on the Eastern Front kept the project going. The MKB-42H then evolved into the MP-43, cleverly using the machine and pistol designation to fly under the radar of the disapproving Hitler. The weapon was successful on the Eastern Front, where the long-range fire, which the MP-43 couldn't handle, wasn't particularly needed by German forces, and instead, a counter to the incessant volley of fire from Russian PPSHs was needed. The MP-43 was then upgraded and given the Sturmgewehr designation, which translates to Storm Rifle or Assault Rifle in English, and thus the term Assault Rifle was born, and along with it, a new MP-43, known as the STG-44. The Sturmgewehr was pretty much identical to the MP-43, save for a few cost-cutting improvements. However, the MP-43 and STG-44 came a little too late, and failed to make a difference in the war, even though they were substantially better than the weapons that the Allies were fielding. The worst thing is, the German trials groups of the 1940s pointed out the need for the assault rifle, but their reports had not been listened to. 
Had Germany listened to these reports, they could have had the entirety of the German army armed with Sturmgewehrs before the beginning of the war, and this advantage in firepower could have genuinely changed the outcome of World War II. It's hard to say whether the FG-42 was the first assault rifle. On one hand, it was rifle-sized and fired from external box magazines in fully automatic. On the other hand, it used a full-sized cartridge instead of an intermediate one. Either way, it's definitely some sort of rifle and definitely not an LMG despite what Sniper Elite 4 will try to tell you. The FG-42 was developed for use by Luftwaffe paratroopers due to the need of an automatic weapon that was smaller than a full machine gun because the Luftwaffe could not fit machine guns in their planes. The FG-42 was certainly a trailblazer, but it felt the consequences of coming first. The weapon was burdened with the 7.92 by 57mm cartridge, which was quite frankly ridiculous for a man-portable automatic weapon. This made the recoil incredibly strong when fired in automatic mode. The weapon also overheated quickly in automatic fire, which defeated the point of the weapon itself, which was to have a man-portable automatic rifle. As a semi-automatic, it worked fine, but it was put out of favour rather quickly. Had the Nazis listened to the trials groups of the 30s, which is a recurring theme, and chambered it for the 7.92 by 33mm intermediate cartridge used on the Sturmgewehr, the weapon could have been very effective, but of course the Nazis didn't care. They were produced from 1942 until 1945, but in those three years, only about 7,000 were actually built. The Winchester Model 1897, known more colloquially as the Trench Gun, was based on the older Model 1893 and improved on it greatly. After experience in the Philippine-American War of 1899, it was seen just how dirty and up-close trench warfare could be. The US saw that they needed a weapon specifically for trench warfare and, while submachine guns were still a while off, the shotgun was a logical solution. The model 1897 trench grade was promptly created, which features a short 20 inch barrel, heat shield and bayonet lug. The weapon was used by American troops during World War I. It has been said that soldiers who had previous experience in trap shooting were issued with this gun with the intent of shooting enemy grenades in mid-air, which is literally the coolest thing ever to happen. The Americans were the only nation to really use shotguns in World War II, with the British having side-by-side -side shotguns, but these were deemed too ineffective due to their low capacities. The German troops protested the use of the trench gun, saying it violated a passage from the 1907 Hague Convention of Land Warfare, which read, It is especially forbidden to employ arms, projections, or materials calculated to cause unnecessary suffering. The American judge who decided the case, of course, said that there was nothing wrong at all with shotguns. Germany was cross and they promptly hit back saying that they would punish all captured American soldiers who had a shotgun. America then played into Germany's double standard about weapons that cause undue suffering and said that they would punish all captured soldiers found with serrated bayonets or flamethrowers. This is about as much corporate rubbish as the Winchester M1895 had to face last episode, which you should watch if you haven't already, link in the top left. Shameless self-promotion over. The M30 drilling was an unusual survival weapon used by civilians for hunting purposes. The Luftwaffe thought these were great and issued them as survival weapons to pilots in North Africa. This was certainly a bad idea, as nothing that lives in this region needs anywhere near as much firepower as the drilling offers to take it down. Some say this was an honest mistake on the Luftwaffe's part, as they had the misconception that pilots would be coming across big cats, but I reckon it was just because Hermann Goering really liked hunting. The drilling featured two 12-bore shotgun barrels in the side-by-side -side configuration typical of the time. One barrel featured chokes intended for slug rounds, and the other featured chokes intended for bird shot. The rifle barrel, located underneath the shotgun barrels, was in the middle of the gun, and was chambered for the enormous 9.3 by 74mm rimmed cartridge, which is enough to stop an aircraft carrier, let alone a lion. 
Despite the fact that the drilling was more than capable of annihilating a human being, it was never used as an anti-personnel weapon, presumably for the same reason that we never used side by sides. The Panzerfaust was a German single-use anti-tank weapon designed as a lighter and cheaper version of the Panzerschreck. The weapon has its roots in the Faust Patron rocket launcher of 1942, which was a much smaller rocket of a similar design. The Faust Patrona warhead could penetrate up to 140mm of armour. The German army soon started designing a larger version of the Faust Patrona and called it the Panzerfaust. The Panzerfaust was designed as an inexpensive, single-use rocket launcher and unlike in Sniper Elite 4, it was designed to be fired from under the arm like this photograph shows. The Panzerfaust featured a tall flip-up sighting system on the top of the firing tube, and instead of the more conventional trigger system found on the Bazooka and Panzer Shrek, the Panzerfaust used a pedal system, which was gently depressed by the operator to fire the weapon. The Panzerfaust was extremely powerful, being substantially more damaging to armour than both the Panzer Shrek and Bazooka, although the weapon's short effective range of 30 metres meant using the Panzerfaust required a great amount of courage. The writing on the side of the Panzerfaust translates to caution, fire jet, warning soldiers about the large backblast produced by the rocket. It costed 20 Reichmarks to produce compared to the Panzerschreck which costed 70 Reichmarks. The Neun Faust is based upon the real life Fliegerfaust, which was also known as the Luftfaust, which translates to pilot fist or air fist. The weapon had nine barrels, each firing 20mm unguided rockets, and these ro rockets were designed to shoot down low flying aircraft. The Fliegerfaust was never properly used in service because of its poor range and accuracy, but this photo does clearly show some Fliegerfaust lying in the rubble of this destroyed building. 10,000 launchers and 4 million rockets were ordered by the German army towards the end of the war, who were at this point off their rocker and completely mad, but only about 80 made it into service. Thank you everyone for watching the video. Remember to like, subscribe and comment. It costs you nothing and it's a great way to help out the channel. Stay safe and goodbye.